first off, I want to start with uh, making a couple of comments <clears throat> about being part of trading markets. Uh, first off, my name is Gary Kalpbaum. I'm an investment advisor, also a technician, market technician uh, with First Union. I write commentary at uh, tradingmarkets.com. I just got to tell you that um, uh, my history uh, in the business, I started selling penny stocks out of college. Uh, that's where I started. So I just want to make sure everybody realizes uh, that it does not matter where you come from. Uh, you can become good at something. Work, ethic, sweat, discipline, passion, now addiction. Uh, but all those words uh, mean a lot. Uh, I'm just uh, delirious the fact that I get to do, do trade, be a part of trading markets and knowing people like Lauren, uh, Kevin Martyr in the past, and, and some of these other people. Uh, we all share one uh, common bond and a common goal is A, uh, we have a passion for what we do. Uh, that's number one. And number two is we also have a passion to help everybody else out there. We have all gone through the same things you all go through every single day and still do. And that is the emotions, the physicality, that everything goes with the markets and your money. And we all know for a fact that your money means a lot to you or you wouldn't be here right now. It's not just the game, it's also your well-being, your family's well-being, your fiscal well-being, your retirement and your future. And that's why we take it very, very seriously. We're going to cover a lot of points here today and I don't know what Lauren's goals are. Uh, and he will tell you in a second, but uh, my single goal is to make everyone in here understand that 99% of this world uh, ends up being average. 1% uh, ends up being very successful for one reason and one reason only. It, it's, it's passion and it's the willing to take that extra step. We believe we have and, and you being here, you know, that shows that, uh, you know, you want to go forward. The goal is today, when you walk out of here, at least as far as I'm concerned, to make sure that you know, regardless of what you hear on TV and everywhere else out there about technical analysis and charting stocks and all that other stuff that they call voodoo, let everybody else think it does not work. We're going to let you know it does. We have proven it out over the years. We have learned from some of the greatest technicians out there on Wall Street, and uh, you will see by the end of the, this day, you will be walking out of here. Emotion, I don't know. I don't know where you're going to be, how you feel uh, about things going forward, but we are going to show you sound disciplines that if you work hard at it, and once again, remember what I just said, work hard at it, it's just not going to come to you. You're going to have to work and you're going to practice and you're going to practice and you're going to work. But if you put the time in, you will walk out of here doing two things. A, buying right. B, getting the heck out when you're wrong. And being wrong small, being right bigger. I've spoken to some of the greatest market people in the world that had years where 30% of their stocks went up during that year and they were still up 100% just because of that. So it's not just about looking and seeing charts and looking at action and price and volume movements, looking at sentiment. It's also how you manage the money and how you dictate policy out there. So enjoy the show. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session later. Uh, all yes, just keep a, a good ear open. We have a lot of information. We're going to show you a lot of pictures. We're not going to give you opinion. We're going to show you fact and pictures of things that have worked, characteristics, models of some of the biggest winning stocks of the last few years and show you simply they all look the same. Every one of them looked the same. You didn't have to turn on CNBC and have some donut head up there tell you what something's going to be like at the end of the year. I have a little, you know, I, I bring props to all my workshops and in case you don't know, Unfortunately for the average investor with the average broker who most averagely listens to his analysts, unfortunately 87% uh, of all stocks in the market last year were buy recommendations or strong buys, uh, amazingly. Uh, this comes from uh, Zach's investment research, this is fact. 
So that community has been found out. I don't blame them. I blame the structure of how things go. You won't have to worry about those things anymore. You're not going to worry about opinion. You're not going to worry about Maria Bartiromo in the morning saying, this stock is on fire, and you're jumping all over it. You're going to look at facts. There's a guy named Marty Schwartz, one of the greatest traders in history. I read one little comment from him years ago. It was in Barron's, and it said, looking at charts is like looking at a photo album and looking for familiar faces. And that's all we're going to do today. Using your eyes is very key. And I know there's stochastics, there's MACDs, there's Fibonacci's and 1.8's and 3.6's. We're going to care about price and volume movement today. And we're going to care about sentiment. We're going to talk about how everybody is bearish. You better be on the other side of that ship. And the converse also. We're going to go through one by one, hopefully put the pieces of the puzzle together and make sure you're all better uh, traders and investors today. So that is my introduction. Mr. Lauren Fleckenstein. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our conference. Um, uh, my name is Lauren Fleckenstein, and uh, I think many of you know me from writing for Investors Business Daily, and now I'm a commentary writer for an education writer for tradingmarkets.com. Um, I got into intermediate term trader just by sheer luck. Um, I was working as a, as a reporter, a mainstream newspaper uh, reporter, a few years ago and um, sent off for the two-week trial subscription with IBD and put Bill O'Neill's promotional tape in my car cassette player and listened to it. It just had the ring of truth. And I immediately ran out, got the book, subscribed to IBD, and began trading my account and realized, hey, I'm living in LA when I go work for IBD. And um, uh, uh, within a year, I was working for, uh, for, for Bill indirectly as a writer for, uh, for Investors Business Daily until uh, trading markets came and wooed me away about a year and a half ago. Um, I think uh, Gary, I think, uh, gave you a pretty good introduction as to what we're going to cover today. I guess I'd just like to add a, a couple of things. Um, First of all, uh, those of you who trade the intermediate term in high momentum stocks, or in other words, high relative strength stocks, uh, it, it's good to realize that you're part of uh, a great tradition in trading that dates back at least to uh, the early 1900s uh, with Jesse Livermore. And um, if uh, you're looking for an interesting biography of Livermore, who I regard as perhaps the greatest trader who ever lived, there's a new one out by Richard Smitten, S-M-I-T-T-E-N. Uh, it's called The Amazing Life of Jesse Livermore. And I also review it in trading markets. If you go into the book review section of trading markets, you'll see. He led a very interesting life. Imagine being so powerful that the equivalent of Alan Greenspan in your era asks you to stop short selling. Uh, imagine being so powerful that the President of the United States asks you to release your corner on, I forget whether it was the cotton market, one of the commodities markets he had a successful corner on. Back in those days, it was perfectly legal. Um, and uh, Livermore believed in following leadership stocks. Uh, and he uh, shorted them, and he went long, and he believed in letting the market tell you what it was going to do. He did not take uh, a stand based on an opinion uh, of where a stock should be and then hold that. He would, he would exit if the position turned against him in a fundamental way. He let the stocks dictate uh, where he traded. And he traded for what we would consider today to be the intermediate term. In other words, he would hold positions for weeks to months. Uh, in some cases. Uh, after Jesse Livermore, uh, perhaps the next most noted uh, intermediate term trader who left us uh, a record would be Nicholas Darvas, uh, D-A-R-V-A-S. And he wrote a book, I don't know if it's in print at present, but if not, I'm sure it will be again, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. And Darvis, uh, like Livermore before him, would look for stocks that were in powerful trends, that would form bases, he called them boxes, he called it his box theory, and he'd buy them on breakout. And he refused 
to, like Livermore, he refused to listen to other people's opinion. He looked simply at the stocks. He looked simply at the price action. Of course, we all know uh, Bill O'Neill. Uh, another great name would be William Gyler, uh, uh, who wrote a book. I'd say the first six or seven chapters are helpful. Uh, later in the book, there's may have then uh, how charts can help you in the stock market. Um, but anyway, you're part of a you're part of a of a, of a method of trading which. Uh, has existed for quite some time, as long as there's been successful traders. Um, the other thing I'd like to just mention briefly is the topic of technical analysis. Uh, I'm probably 75% technical in my trading and 25% fundamental. And um, uh, the stock market is a free market. What is more fundamental than supply and demand? And all technical analysis is, is a graphical representation of supply and demand. How uh, buying and selling volume are meeting to produce a new equilib equilibrium price, whether it's a higher price or a lower price. And so anyone who says that technical analysis is not a valid way of looking at stocks is someone who doesn't really understand what a market is. Uh, uh, technical analysis, uh, Mark Minervini, uh, a market wizard and um, winner of the 1997 U.S. Investing Championship, uh, likes to call volume the most fundamental fundamental, or, and, uh, or supply and demand is the most fundamental fundamental. And certainly that's the way I feel as well. Uh, and finally, um, uh, congratulate yourselves. You're still trading and you've been through the bear market of 2000. Whereas this market has wiped out so many accounts, if you've used good, uh, uh, even if you had no idea where the market was going, if you used good money management, if you used price stops, uh, you protected the majority of your capital. And you, you may well have protected the majority of your gains as well. And you're, st you're still here to fight now and take advantage of what appears to be, albeit a volatile one, uh, uh, a new rally, intermediate term rally in the market. Uh, so you now have the benefit of a tremendous education understanding what happens when a bubble bursts without having lost your bankroll. And uh, I believe with discipline and with passion, uh, over time, that experience will stand you in very good stead going forward in the future in terms of preserving your, uh, preserving your gains and preserving your capital. Anyway, I believe our first um, item is trading as a hobby, trading as a business not as a hobby, and I'll turn this over to Gary. First off, if you want to know about problems with supply and demand, look at, just look at California. I would love to own a stock where there's just a ton of demand and no supply, and that's basically what's happened there. And anybody thinks it's anything else but the fact of that, that's it. And if you took technical analysis with the problem in California, I'd say you'd end up with um, like CMGI of the year, 1999 straight up. And that's, that's basically how the markets do work, by the way. Uh, Trading is a business, you as a, as a business, your life as a business. In some of my commentaries, it's not just about, uh, well, these three stocks broke out on four times average volume. I try to give also how I feel, uh, some life words that I've learned uh, from some of the greatest successes out there. I'm just letting you know whether it's trading, investing, or whatever else you do in life, whether it's your family, friendships, your wife, your husband, your business, I don't care what you do. If you don't do it with passion, if you don't treat it seriously, you are going to be left behind and be behind somebody who does. That's all I can tell you. What's funny, I just found out last week about Larry Bird is going to be at the uh, Las Vegas uh, 2001 uh, trading markets. Uh, when I go across the country and do my workshops, I always talk about him because everybody knows how great he was, but nobody realizes while all the other players that are much more talented th than him would go home, he'd be sitting at the free throw line for five hours to 11 o'clock at night. He would take a, a thousand shots from three point range uh, while everybody was out on the golf course. Luck, skill, you call it what it is, 
He treated himself like a business. He treated himself seriously. And somebody with not the greatest talent in the world became one of the greatest NBA stars in history. That's the best lesson I can give you here when investing. This money that you have to invest, I don't know whether it was inherited or you made it, but think about how long it took to save that money, not just make it. I'm talking about after you school your children, you buy your home, your cars, your planes, your trains, and things like that. People, investors, do not take it seriously enough. And if anything was the wake-up call, was the year 2000 to take investing seriously. I have so many people walking through my door right now that had $2 million accounts that are sitting at $300,000. And they have to go back to work. And people have tears in their eyes over last year. But if you really had a sound investing discipline that keeps you out and a real passion for what you do, you could be still in this game that we call the stock market. And yes, in case you don't know, that was historic. It was the worst as far as I'm concerned. I studied some of the past. In time, it was the worst in history. There is no doubt. 70% drop in a major index. And it's not like it was a 70% drop in a railroad stock. It was 70% drop in a major index that everybody was not knee deep in, but neck deep. And anybody who did not see what was coming and get a feel and know what the market has to say got hit. So my first message to you is, if you're going to be serious, be serious in anything you do in life. Take it serious. Treat yourself like a corporation. Every month I plan my month out. Every quarter I plan it out. I just don't let the world happen to me. I plan out myself. Treat yourself seriously. And this is a great start. And whether it's from us or anybody else, uh, read, learn, absorb. That's all I can tell you. I am a book hog. I am a reading hog. I'm six newspapers a day, 10 magazines a month. You can never have enough knowledge. Just make sure who you're listening to kind of has an idea about what they're saying. And you know what I mean by that? Certain TV shows or cable business shows that sometimes you worry about. OK, first things first, about Gary. As far as trading as a business, as I told you, I started selling penny stocks. I didn't have a clue. I got done with penny stocks. I decided if I was going to stay in this business, I'm going to need to know what the heck's going on. Because I kept reading about Mario Gabellis and all these guys that know how to manage money. So you know what the heck I did? I found them. I said, if I'm going to be good at something, I better find out who's already good at it and find out what they're doing. It's just like, you want to be a great home run hitter? Are you going to uh, take a, a video out of some 200 batter with eight home runs a year? Are you going to pull out Mark McGuire's video and Sammy Sosa's? That's how you got to play this. You got to already look at who's doing it well. And that's what I did. And just by luck, and, I, and I'm one of these guys that carry things that mean a lot to me with me, and I'll do it the rest of my life. Why? Because when you take a step back like I did yesterday, you go back to the readings that brought you to the dance. This is an article by William O'Neill, I think it was 1991 in Registered Rep Magazine. Uh, this is where I f even first heard about him. And basically it was about, they asked him the question about the brokerage industry. And he said, well, unfortunately, and this is 91, and it still goes for today, unfortunately, 10 years later. And the question was, has the brokerage industry lost its way? He goes, yes. They still bring in the brokers, they, uh, the big firms. They send them to New York. And you know what they teach them how to do? They teach them how to sell, but they don't teach them how to manage money, and they don't teach them how to manage the markets. They teach them how to sell. So there's, and he went on to say there is room for people in our industry that really want to learn. That was my start right there. The alarm bell went off that day, and I carry this with me all the time. Why? You, oh, you don't forget where you came from. And this, I, like I said, it was 1991. So all, the most important thing I can tell you I don't know if you ever, any, who here has listened to, heard my radio show? Anybody? It's passion. It's seriousness. It's knowing and caring and understanding that this is an important part of people's li lives and livelihoods as well as mine. The, the trading markets is therapy for me. So just going forward, right after this article, I took out for six months straight. I started practicing, went to one of his workshops in Boca Raton, read his books. 
I think I'm on my 28th time I've read his books, uh, as well as uh, other people out there. My wife thinks I'm a nut, but that's okay. She has a big house now. Um, and I practiced, and I took out a notepad, and I still have the notepads from 91, and I played with fake money. And I started following, and you know what? My first stock I bought blew up. Second one blew up, and I wasn't using any money, but I just have this diary of stocks that I bought. And then after about six, seven, or eight months, uh, I started, you know what, started getting more comfortable realizing, hey, this works. And the first stock I ever bought, based on this discipline of breakouts, great earnings, great revenue growth, was EMC Corp. And I, we may have that here. And you know what, it went up 60% in a matter of like three months, and I'm like, whoa, hey, I sold it, went up sixfold within 12 months, and I'm still banging my head. But you know what? It was a win, and that's what started this off. And I have to tell you, if I find something else that works, I'm going to go with it. Uh, I'm a big believer in the motto, whatever works, and that's what you have to do also. If it doesn't work, take a step back. If you're failing a few times, take a step back, but start measuring yourself. People like Bill Gates, I learned this from him. Every quarter, and this is treating yourself as a business, every quarter, I'm gone. I take a two to three day goner by myself. I take 10 legal pads with me and I go over my life. What happened during the quarter? Not just in investing, but everything else. Am I spending enough time with my children, my wife? How am I treating them? Friends, finances, health. Am I 10 pounds overweight? Am I underweight? Am I, you know, whatever it may be. And I take these little retreats. Why? If Bill Gates does it, I'm doing it. If Mark McCormick, who heads up uh, the number one, uh, Mark McCormick wrote the book uh, about Harvard School, what they don't teach you in Harvard. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And I have to tell you, it just gives a roadmap every It gives you a roadmap. I have a things to do list every day. Uh, my legal pad is my, my best friend. My diary is my best friend. That's what you should be doing when investing. Every trade you do, put it down. Put down where you're selling. Why did you buy it? If you're wrong, what do you think happened there? And if, the, if you're wrong a couple of times, a few times, figure things out. Don't just let things happen because they happen. You know why? That's what the average person does. Don't ever be average. Corporations, GE, guess what they do? They have strategic meetings. They're not just for the next week, the next month, three years, five years. Mike Ovitz, anybody heard of him? Out in uh, California with the big super agents. Uh, all I know is he went to Disney for a year and got like 191 million. He's doing something right uh, uh, for, for doing nothing there. But here's a guy that plans out his year, three year, and five year goals up front. Up front. Now, you actually can't do that in the market, but you as an individual, you can't control the market. You can control you. And by having these goals every single day, week, month, year, it just makes life so much easier. It gives you a roadmap, especially if you, if you have a definable goal out there. That's what this whole business is about. I think this is why I've gotten to this point. I don't think it's been by luck. It's been by hard work, passion. And every single day, I wake up knowing what my day is going to be about, what I have to do, what I don't do, how to keep away from mistakes, things like that. And that is going to be the necessity going forward. The greatest business people, traders, investors, or anybody else out there, that is one of the major secrets of success. And I urge you, very simply, take this darn seriously because there are people out there that have made, look at Warren Buffett. You think that happened because it was an accident? He planned it out, found out a system that worked, and he takes it all seriously. Thank you. And we move on. What's that? Are you going to talk about that too? Yes. Um, one of the uh, perhaps the most fundamental thing that I learned uh, that turned around my trading was that mastering a strategy, whether it's, whether it's Can Slim or whether it's the methods in the Kuhn Martyr course or it's a, a Jeff Cooper day trading strategy, is probably 30, 40% of the game. 
Self-mastery is the, uh, the challenge that I think separates intelligent failures with intelligent successes. Uh, in other words, trading is at least as much a game of overcoming your emotions as it is learning a given strategy very well. Now, in my own case, I, um, uh, I had the benefit of getting started uh, right away with one of the best trading methodologies that you could hope to adopt. Um, uh, before um, uh, I read Bill O'Neill's book, I barely knew what a price to earnings ratio was. I hadn't even opened my first trading account. So I got started right off the bat with, uh, with an excellent strategy. And I had mentors who uh, trained me very thoroughly in good loss control. And I didn't listen to the Maria Bartram. I didn't make a lot of the mistakes a lot of people made. I had a very sound methodology, but I still was losing money. And you may find in your own trading strategy that you have personal habits, personal psychological drives, certain emotional needs that make you vulnerable to losses, vulnerable to failure. And the market has a way of finding those things and uncovering them. And it's okay. Uh, discovering those things is part of the process of learning to be a good trader. In my own case, I was just dying to trade. I was itching to trade. Uh, it would drive me nuts to see stocks going up and not participating. And uh, I had access to um, real-time quotes. I had access to institutional database for sc screening stocks. I had all these wonderful tools. And during the trading day, if I saw a stock breaking out of a base, and I had never looked at this stock before, I'd do a quick check, analyze its relative strength, its fundamentals, its pattern, and if it looked like it was a good, uh, a good buy, I would jump on it. And two things happened when I would do that. One is, is that when a stock breaks out, you must be ready to pounce immediately. If you let that thing move, it's going to extend past your pivot point, and you're going to miss out on that initial price profit that initial paper profit, which combined with your percentage stop, gives you a cushion for any adverse volatility before it continues in the direction of your trade. So I was buying good stocks, but that were, that were extended. And when they had pulled back, I'd get stopped out. Another thing I would be doing is, since I was discovering these stocks on the day they broke out, I would do a quick check of the fundamentals of the price chart and jump in. Whereas if I were studying these things more closely, I might have uncovered aspects in the chart or something in the fundamentals that would have told me don't go near this stock. Like it may have just had its third split in a year and a half or uh, there might have been something uh, in the earnings that would have distorted the quality of the earnings. I'd missed that stuff. So I was buying stocks uh, uh, in many cases that uh, at first blush looked fine on a fundamental technical basis but there was something deeper in them that would have worn me off later. So because I, because I had good loss control, I never took a huge loss in any one of these stocks. But I was dying the death of a thousand cut. I was buying stocks that were too extended and getting stopped out. So even my winners weren't there to help offset my small losses. And eventually I, I realized that the problem with me wasn't that I didn't understand the strategy that I had adopted. The problem with me was that I was letting my desire for action overwhelm my business-like approach to making money. Uh, in the first Market Wizards book, which if you don't have, I definitely recommend. It's Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. There's an interview with Ed Sakota, who says, everybody gets what they want in the stock market. You just may not know that you want it. On a subconscious level, what I wanted was to play. I wanted trading action. On a conscious level, yeah, I wanted money. Who doesn't? But this other drive was acting behind my, uh, my trading. And once I understood myself well enough to realize that, and realize that impulse was, was, was causing me to fail, then I was able to eliminate it. Just being aware of it was, it was a big step. Now, you may have your own psychological failings. You may, um, after a long bear market, you may see pr 
uh, breakouts proliferating all over the place. You may see a follow-through day, and you may lack the courage of your convictions to act. Um, there may be times when you get just too euphoric when you're handling a position. There, there could be any number of things that are at work in you. And so you need, to, you need to take yourself very seriously. And when you're analyzing your trades at the end of the day or at the end of the week or at the end of the quarter, uh, as Gary and I do, think about, and by keeping a daily diary, um, uh, you'll be able to recall some of this stuff. Don't simply look at the chart and ask yourself, okay, I lost money on this stock. Now, what could I miss in the chart? Try to remember and try to know what you were thinking at the time you were trading that stock. You know, jot a note down as you're trading it. You know, or what caused you decide to, to buy that stock or why you made that, that sell decision. Try to self-appraise yourself. And over time, you will see patterns in your own behavior. And you will see when those kinds of uh, uh, impulses uh, tend to form a, uh, a, a sort of a common behavioral trait of yours through your trading life. And, and you'll make some discoveries about yourself. And you'll be able to eliminate a lot of that stuff getting into your decision making. Um, I talk about this in much more detail uh, in um, an article, uh, the first article there called, I believe, The Mindful Discipline of the uh, uh, Medium Term Trader. Um, uh, we have here um, uh, a number of rules that are distilled from that article. Uh, the importance of cutting losses. We'll talk about uh, money management in greater detail uh, uh, later in the course, but I just can't hammer this home enough. Once you set an initial price stop, do not second guess it. If you're going to be at it 8% and the stock goes down at 8%, don't say, well, I'll give it another percentage move. You are getting on the slippery slide to um, a big loss if you do that. You may um, make money on that stock. It may do a U-turn and, and make money for you, but if you do that long enough, you're going to kill your account. Um, uh, the, the point here, be primed to pounce within 2 or 3 percent of your pivotal point, which is what Jesse Livermore called them, Bill O'Neill calls them pivot points. Uh, let's say you're trading off a cup with handle, and uh, you buy as the stock exceeds the handle by an eighth of a point. Um, I know there are some traders who talk about buying within 5%, and I think that was probably valid about you know, 10 years ago or so. But now, with so many traders watching stocks in real time uh, using online accounts, um, you need to be in, I believe, much sooner than 5%. I consider something beyond 3% to be uh, extended. Again, the idea is that you're trying to catch these moves as something significant, as, start, as, a, as a big move is starting to occur. You catch a stock very close after its pivot point, and if it does work out, if you do get that initial pop, the point is, is that you want that pop not so that you can immediately sell and bank a profit. You want that paper profit to add to your percentage stop below your cost and give you a greater cushion. So if that stock encounters volatility, uh, you'll be able to stay in without getting stopped up. You won't die the death of a thousand cuts that I was dying when I was engaging in my hyperactive trading. Uh, by the way, uh, how many people in here are using, ha have a source of streaming real-time quotes with alerts? Okay, some of you don't. That is absolutely essential. Okay, otherwise you're just not going to catch the stocks that you are buying on breakouts soon enough. You know, if you're checking those, those quotes like um, uh, once a day, two times a day, several times in the morning, these are going to break out when you're not watching and you're going to be buying them five, six, seven percent extended beyond their pivot points. So you need to have a source of streaming quotes. You don't have to be staring at it. They have, they come with alerts. You can be sitting here typing away on your computer, and all of a sudden, uh, your speaker will, uh, will sound a bell, uh, and um, it'll come up with a chart of the stock that you're watching, and you're ready to pounce. But you need to have a source of real-time streaming quotes. There's a good service uh, uh, that we have listed in, in the workbook. Uh, there are a number of other good quote services out there as well. You, um, 
but, but you need to have that. And if, if you have the kind of job that, um, that doesn't allow you to be near a computer all the time, you might check to see if some of these quote services offer a cellular or a page paging capability, uh, provided that you can get online quickly with a personal digital assistant or what have you and, and execute your trade or your sell. Um, let's see here. Again, perform regular post-game analysis of your trades. Gary's talked about this. Uh, one of the things that I like to do also is I like to save uh, my investor's business dailies for, for one year. So if I'm looking at a trade, uh, and I'll make a printout of a chart uh, of the day I bought a stock and the day I sold it, sometimes I'll look at the chart and I really won't recall at the end of a quarter or end of a year why it was that I was buying or selling under those conditions. And I'll pull out, or I'll wonder what I was missing. I'll pull out the investor's business daily from that day, and I'll look at the general market sectors page, you know, which has the Dow, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the underlying market volumes, the psychological indicators, the group work. And I'll look, and I'll look at what was going on in the general environment at the time that I sold my stock. And that will sometimes give me an insight into what I was, at, what I was acting on at that particular time, uh, or what I might have missed in the general market. Uh, after I became aware of my, my own hyperactive trading, I adopted two rules, and uh, I think these are pretty good ones for you to stick by as well. Um, you should set aside a time after market hours, away from the pressure of the trading day, the distractions of the trading day, to, to do your hunting for stocks. After the market closes, it can be on the weekend. I do a lot of my work on Sunday. Uh, you know, you sit down with your daily graphs or your Telescan Pro Search or whatever it is, your IBDs, whatever it is that you're using, your trading market stock scanner, whatever you're using to, to, to hunt for potential buys or potential short sales. And I do, uh, you know, I'll look at hundreds and hundreds of charts over the weekend looking for potential ideas, which I will then study more closely. And then I'll have a set of stocks. If they look like they're setting up, I'll isolate my pivot points and I'll feed those into my real-time quote software so that when the trading day or the trading week starts, the machine is programmed, it's ready to go, it's ready to alert me when those stocks break out. What I'm not doing is looking for stocks during the trading day. If there's something that I find that looks interesting during the trading day, I'll sure I'll write the ticker down, I may even look at the chart, but generally speaking, I won't trade it. I want to study that stuff uh, after hours. Um, and then, because you've done all your homework in advance, when that thing breaks up, breaks, breaks out, there is no more homework to do. There is no decision to make. You just, the only decision to make is you execute your plan. I put the stock on my, uh, on my potential buy list. I said I was going to buy it. It would hit that alert. It's doing that now. It's already been vetted. There's nothing else to, to, to debate. You pounce. And then you can catch those within 1%, 2%, 3% of their pivot while everyone else is sitting there twiddling their thumbs trying to decide what's going on there. You've already made the decision. Um, no idea qualifies f uh, for my list without passing through a review conducted outside normal trading hours. Another thing about that is not only does the stock have to pass my various tests um, uh, on fundamental and technical criteria, um, I generally like, don't like to have more than fifth. Now, Gary may, may he, he trades a lot of accounts and has a lot of money. You probably have a, a larger number of positions. But I generally don't like to have more than 10, 15 stocks on my watch list. That's enough to watch. It's enough to research. And what that does is it forces me to put only the very best stocks on that list. I might see 20 stocks that all look pretty good, that all meet my basic criteria. But of those, what are the 15 or 10 very best? And that upgrades the quality of, the, of, the, of what I'm hunting for. Yes, some of the ones that I kick out may, may take off and I'll miss out on them. But generally speaking, you know, you're forcing yourself to, to go with the stocks that really meet your criteria the best. And uh, these rules you'll find in the article. I don't think we need to repeat them.
And this final quote here, what the mind does, that experiences as truth. Again, what your mind is, is being influenced by, that influences your reality. Your reality is a subjective reality. And so you need to become aware of those kinds of things. You need to become aware of sometimes why certain patterns might scare you. Like if a stock has had a terrific run, now it's putting in a consolidation, and it looks too high to you. Go back and look at some of the great winning stocks and look at how high they would have looked when you're not looking at the pattern down here in the subsequent price rise. Look at, look at how it looked when it was forming that pattern in 1991 like Microsoft or, or in you know, some of these biotechs in 1999. They looked high then as well. Train your mind to understand what these stocks looked like before they began their great runs. A lot of them looked um, uh, extended in terms of their price trends. You know, whatever it is that makes, you, makes your mind vulnerable to fear or becoming over euphoric, once you identify that about yourself, find ways to reprogram your mind, if you will, so that you don't fool yourself with your own subjective reality. Okay, um, I'm going to turn the fundamental analysis part over here to Mr. Kaltbaum. Please call me Gary. <laughs> Great points uh, Lauren made uh, that I want to go over. Number one is after market hours. My schedule, um, I do a radio show at the close of the market, uh, 1 o'clock here, 4 o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, go home, do the basketball thing with the kids, hang out. 7.30 is always Seinfeld. Uh, that's a definite. After everybody's asleep, I am on the computer. That is where the work is done. When I don't have to worry about things moving during the day, that is the key. You should all have a great charting service. The time away from the market is definitely going to be key. Let me show you a few things that I do. First off, I knew that was going to happen. I have daily graphs hard copy. I don't know. Anybody use these? Good. Uh, of course, this is printed products by O'Neill. Uh, I get them every Sunday. And if you all just would go through here, I go through every chart and those yellow highlighters are the ones that you can throw out and it really gives me an idea of market conditions when you go through every stock and by the end of the couple of hours and three hours I'm going through them if my highlighters out of ink it tells me the markets in real bad shape believe it or not that's really how it goes and it gives you a real good feel because during the week I have a bunch of quote machines and, it show, and I have um, things measured by sectors. Here's the Dow 30. Here's, well, excuse me. Here's the energy sector. So I'm always able to see every day if things are down big or up big. I bring home also uh, volume percent ups and downs every day. And this is printed off my computers at work. That way when I get home I already have a good feel, but then I really do the intensive work. So real big key is to be doing that at night. Uh, I keep IBD for uh, three months. What I will do though is if there are very important times, I can tell you I have the month the market topped. I will keep it forever from March of 99. Uh, this recent intermediate term bottom that we've had, I'll keep that. We'll see how far it goes. Beats the heck out of me uh, what tomorrow brings. And I just keep them for uh, as long as I need. Uh, daily graphs that hard copy, I keep the end of quarter each one. I have 1987's crash. I can tell you one of the ways I was able to call last year's top, and I did not know it would get that bad, uh, but certainly had all the same characteristics of a lot of parabolic moves. Uh, and, you know, history looks the same sometimes on charts. Uh, Lauren said something about how many stocks you own. Um, agreed. You know what my biggest problem is? In a big account, I buy too many, you get stopped out easily of a couple because that's just the nature of the beast. So you really want to try and get the best, and I still don't know um, what the best means. The best stocks are the ones that go up. I guess that's the best definition out there. Some general fundamental talk here. Uh, first off, um, studies have been done, and 95% of the biggest winners uh, happen for one very important reason, and that is great new products, great new inventions, 
great new things that came out. It's a fact of life, and that's where you as an investor and as an individual needs to keep their eyes open, their ears completely open. You need to listen, see, feel, touch, and not enough of that has been, uh, ha does go on. I can tell you uh, back in 92, when Outback Steakhouse came public, Barron's Magazine, who does not like anything, by the way, everything's bad, I'm surprised we're not a communist state yet here, um, said that no way steakhouse chains are going to make it, but if you'd go to any Outback Steakhouse restaurant, there were three-hour waits on a Wednesday. All I can tell you is you ever see a restaurant with three-hour waits and it's a public company, buy the stock. I remember when Snapple first came public and Barron said the same thing. You go to your supermarkets, they owned the whole aisle. But how do you know when a stock tops out? Well, it's called competition. And when you live in America, there's always somebody that wants to do it a little better, a little cheaper. All of a sudden, you had Nantucket Nectars, Lipton Iced Tea, Arizona, the greatest scam in history, then came out with the bottled water. It's amazing how these people sell the billions of dollars worth of bottled water when your tap is the same. I drink bottled water, so I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but this is what you got to be looking out for. Callaway Golf. You go to your uh, golf store and say, can I get a big berth? And they say, four-month wait. You ever find the product where there's a four-month wait? Buy the stock. Uh, I remember I made a big money in Adobe because I saw it all of a sudden. I was opening documents with Adobe Acrobat. These are the little things you got to be doing, watching, feeling, touching. It's very tough with technology stocks because I can tell you, I don't know what a potato chip from a, a, a communications chip, but I certainly do know when I see something that everybody's dying for. My one biggest mistake that I've ever made is something I didn't do, and that's my kids. All of a sudden, they're collecting these little cards called Pokemons. And there's a company called Four Kids Entertainment that breaks out on like nine times average volume. I'm saying, I'm not buying this stuff. Meanwhile, it went up like tenfold within a matter of nine months. And all I know is every kid I meet, everybody I see, Pokemon cards left and right. And they end up with the movies, the cartoons, and everything like that. Use your kids, your, your teenagers with the apparel and, and what they're wearing, whether it's Abercrombie and Fitch or American Eagle Outfitters. These are the things you got to do. Amgen, back, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, new wonder drugs, Epigen, Nupigen, turned that into a, a stock that would just went up, I don't know how many hundredfold off of two great drugs. Think, think, though, when a Pfizer comes out with a great drug, doesn't mean as much. So you're looking for that smaller company uh, because of, they came out with Viagra. Everybody thought the stock would go up tenfold. Not. So look around you. Look for what greatness is coming out. You've had a major drop in technology stocks. And everybody's saying, what's the great new technology that's going to come out? I don't have a clue. But when it does come out, I'm going to know it. I'm going to see it. And I'm going to be watching for those stocks. Everybody thought it was going to be the palm. You knew it wasn't. I knew that wasn't going to be the palm. That's going to, going to lead everybody to, uh, you know, the great riches, great riches. Uh, but just keep looking, keep watching, keep feeling. It could be on your street corner. It can be something that your wife tells you. Look for new things. And guess what? New great things are not going to change. There's always something coming around the corner. Keep that in mind. First step that you need to know about uh, on a fundamental side is that uh, stock p p picking stock winners. Very simple. Um, you have to ex uh, examine leading winners of the past. It's sim simple as that. I said it before, and that is the number one theme that needs to be taught to you. Find the winners in the past and find out what characteristics they have. And I got to tell you that back in 99, I could not talk about it so much because everybody would look at me like I was nuts. But the talk fundamentals in 99 and the beginning of 2000 was you were, looking at the, you were looking like a psychotic at that time because you had companies with no revenues uh, at $20 billion market caps. I kept saying on my radio show about stamps.com, no revenues. They didn't lick a stamp or sell a stamp, and they had an $18 billion market cap. Uh, and all the buy.com, boy, that's a good model real good model of a company. We're, you're going to buy products from us and we're going to lose money on every product, but we're going to be a great stock. It was just amazing what was coming out, but that's over and done. We're back to the real world. And the bottom line is, and this is key, the fundamental reason why a stock goes up 
earnings growth. And anybody tells you differently, I'll show you 10 million models of the last 50 years, and your biggest winning stocks had the strongest earnings growth. The stronger the growth, the better, and the longer they grew with that strong growth, the better. And then find a company that can accelerate that earnings growth, and I will find you a monster. That's it. That is the key. That is life. And bottom line is, the reason why tech is so bad now, because you had a monstrous fall off the cliff deceleration in the growth rates that they had, and the market sought before anybody else did. Amazing. That's why we'll talk technical analysis for most of the day, because it's the stock market action that is the greatest forecaster of the future, bar none unless you have Barbara Eden in your house. That's all I can tell you. So just keep that in mind. Earnings, growth, revenue, growth. Now sometimes you can have great earnings growth on a turnaround, but that can only last so long. IBM, great stock of the last few years, no revenue growth. They just fired half their people, shuttered half their plants, and became a leaner and meaner company. But until they grow their business again, probably going to be a boring stock. I can take you to Microsoft of the last 10 years, Dell, Compaq, all the great winners. They all had huge runs when they had great earnings growth and stopped dead in their tracks when that growth slowed. And I can show you Microsoft going like this with earnings and topping out in the last year as last quarter's earnings, a big fat zero. That is the key. Continue to find those companies with those, that type of growth. Everybody asks me, well, what's great growth to you? The stronger, the better. That's all. I want consistency, the ability to continue to grow. I will never buy companies like, let's see, a network associates or an electronics for imaging that every fourth quarter they blow up. I will never even look at them. So consistency is the key. I love consistency throughout the years. That, that's why you have the Walmarts of the world that just continue to do well even though they're big cap. So just keep that in mind. And the next time we have a crazy move in some weird stocks and you know, we're never going to have an internet bubble ever again, by the way. It's not going to be in our lifetime. That's a fact of life. But these are the things we urge you to stay away from. These are the things I always talk about. This week, immune response, no earnings, no revenues, went up in a uh, little biotech move. Stock got, would drop 60% yesterday because something about the placebo was better than the drug or something like that. These are the things we want you to be careful about. Let the speculator jump into those things. For myself, I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning and hearing some announcement that just buries me. I don't want to wake up in my stock gap down 40% because the drug did not work. So I urge you, that's number one. Number two, the worst losing stocks of the last year were the companies losing money. That's it. I spent two days, two days, and I still have one quote machine devoted to internet and suspect biotech stocks. And I can tell you what's funny on my internet pages, there's a lot of um, zeros, all down to zeros. And I just keep them there, just, just to always keep them in my mind. And I have a lot of stocks that were 250 that are now 50 cents, and they're never coming back. They had all one thing in common, they lose money. And all I can tell you is, in a bear market for stocks, I don't care what the company sells, what the company does, what the company says, what an analyst opinion's about, that stock, is going down and going down big. And I don't care, from A to Z, I spent two days on it. Do not buy companies that are losing money. Sure, you can make money in them, you can. You can catch them right, you can catch a breakout. More often than not, you are buried. Don't be a speculator. Price earnings multiples, they're meaningless to me. They really are. I look at them though, 
because there's something they call a PEG, price to earnings growth and things like that. You know, find the company that's growing 100 times earnings only has a 40 PE and they keep growing that 100, you get big winners. Happened to Dell in 94, 95. Uh, company was growing 70, 80% out of 20 multiple because the market was still worried about whether their earnings were gonna contract and worry about PCs and it just turned out they grew those numbers for a couple of years. The stock went up, I don't know how many fold over a couple of years. I care about growth rates, not price earnings multiples. The stronger the growth rate, the better. Simple as that. Look at P's as measurement stick, fine, well, good. Growth rates are the key. Beating Wall Street estimates. Another little study I did. And the reason why I did the study, because somebody else did the study. Uh, the AIM family of funds, AIM Weingarten, Constellation, Aggressive Growth, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Schooler, I'm not even sure if he runs him anymore. Uh, I was on a conference call with him, I think in 93 and 94, and he talked about how they pick stocks. And you know how they pick stocks? We find companies that beat our earnings estimates by the widest margin, and we buy them until they stop beating earnings estimates by the widest margin. And all I know is a mutual fund company that kept doing 20, 25% a year was good enough for me. So I did my own little study about beating Wall Street estimates. And guess what? It works. So what you need to do at all points in time is get every company's reported earnings and see what they did versus the consensus out there. That's all. You can get it through Zacks, um, First Call, uh, all these consensus estimates. Now things have changed a little bit because of reporting requirements where companies cannot tell analysts certain things until they uh, tell the public, but it's still gonna work the same way. You find that company that's supposed to earn 20 cents a share and they come out with 27, I'm gonna show you a big winner. And we're gonna talk about gaps later, both up and down. You know where gaps come from? It comes from beating Wall Street estimates by a wide margin or missing Wall Street estimates by a wide margin on the gap down. So these are little things I put together. We're talking about taking the little pieces of the puzzle putting, and putting them together here. All this technical analysis, all this movement is caused by these earnings numbers, both good and bad. And that's why you gotta keep on your game. I look at every earnings report in the market as they come out and I continue to review them. I have Zach's printed copies, I think it's like 395 a year, and I'm always looking, this is the next step, earnings estimates going up and down during the middle of the quarter. Does anybody know in here that over the last nine to 12 months about earnings estimates for technology companies just being revised down every week, every week, and nobody really knowing about it? That's very important that you're watching these numbers and you get them from some of these outlets. That was huge for me because all of a sudden I'm saying to myself, man, these stocks are acting poorly, and wow, Dell was supposed to earn 27, now it's 24, now it's 21, and guess where those numbers are coming from? It's not hot air, that's guidance from the companies. And all of a sudden 21's 18, and 18's 14, and all of a sudden I'm singing in Corning, and I'm singing in Nortel, and I'm singing in Lucent, and I'm singing every major company out there. And if you're not following these things, you end up dead. And that's basically what's happened with technology, a major deceleration. A couple other general things uh, that I'm a big believer of. I don't buy cyclical stocks. Why? They don't have the earnings power long term. It's a fact of life. You can go to so many names in chemicals, in paper, in aluminum. Their stocks are where they were six and seven years ago. Why? Because the only time their stocks do well is when the economy is at its strongest and they always go up and they'll lead for two or three months and then they're dead again. It just started happening recently again where uh, some of them start going under pressure. I am not a big believer in cyclical stocks. Uh, coming from experience, do not buy penny stocks, do not buy junk, do not listen to touts, do not listen to shouts, you will get buried. Do not listen to internet chat rooms. You'll never know what the ulterior motive is there, you will get buried. And just because a stock's gone from 100 down to two does not mean it's, going to, it's not gonna go down to one and below. Um, I'm not the biggest of believer in options and futures and things like that, but if you're good at it, God bless you. But I have to tell you, most of the people that I've met that really tried options and futures, uh, I'll let that speak for itself. There are some great people out there, just make sure you know what you're doing. It's tough enough picking stocks 
let alone in a certain time frame. And as far as futures go and coffee and cattle and corn, I have no idea what the weather's gonna be like in Brazil, so I can't tell you what the coffee uh, market's gonna be like or whether the oranges are gonna freeze in Gainesville, Florida. So we'll let you decide on that. The last thing is, and we'll talk about this later, and then I'm done with the fundamental side because we want to get into pictures soon. And th this will be on the uh, managed end of it. Uh, the biggest problem investors have is not what they buy. It's what they don't sell. Uh, I can't say that any louder. And I can talk loud. Uh, the average investor will buy two stocks at 50. One goes to 60, one goes to 40. They'll lock in that $10 profit. Mm, and I'm going to wait till the 40 comes back to 50. And guess what? They forget to realize that the stock that went from 50 to 60 went up for a reason. The stock that went from 50 to 40 went down for a reason. Uh, don't get into that habit. Cut your losses short. Let your winners run. And uh, without even knowing how to pick stocks well, uh, you'll be a much better investor. As far as putting stops on there, all I can tell you is uh, you all have health insurance. You have life. You have home probably on your jewelry. I'm sure you have it on your auto. And there's so many other insurance out there. You have insurance not because of losing money, but it's catastrophic losses. Insurance is to prevent from catastrophes. It's as simple as that. Why not have it on your investments? Take the emotion out of your investing. Do not let stocks drop too much. I believe a 50% drop in a stock, it has to comes back 100% to get you back even. How many 100 percenters have you had in the past? That is what is about money management. All these are little general in nature, but those are the five or six things that have stuck in my mind for life. And the only time I ever make a mistake is when I get away from that. That's the only time when I try to be smarter than the market when I think I'm a genius or I'm too good, and within a day or two, the market will humble me, and then I gotta do it, take a step back, and you should see some of the four letter words that are written in my diary right now, right targeted at myself. So I urge you, these are the most important things that I follow on every single day. Uh, last but not least, mute button on CNBC or you drive yourself up a wall. Uh, that's last but not least. It is, you know, look, I'm, it's an opinion. Uh, a lot of people believe the same thing. It is, it is turned into a folly on CNBC as far as I'm concerned. There's much better out there. They don't report the news anymore. Uh, they drive up the wall with some of the words like amazing, unbelievable, fabulous, this stock's on fire and things like that. Keep your feet on the ground. Stay in your own little box of investing. Don't go outside it. If things stop working, take a step back go on vacation. You don't have to be investing and trading all the time. If things are working, enhance it. But I urge you, most what's out there, opinion does not count. It does not mean a thing. The final arbiter is the market and its action itself. And uh, all you need to do is go back to last year of some of the returns to understand where I'm coming from. This, this part of the this segment of the show, just realize that is the key. You put all these things uh, together and I promise you'll be a much better investor. But if you don't sell when you're wrong, it does not matter how smart or how good you are. It does not matter whether you can buy breakouts or not because great investors, smart people, if they don't stop out, it's over. Because I bought FTP software in a breakout at 33, sold it at 30, zero. I've owned Ariba in the past. It's gone from 135 down to three or four or five, whatever it is. Doesn't matter, does it? We've all had stocks that you bought. If you stopped out right, they've, they've gone to zero. I own Boston Market, made good money in it. Zero. Bought out, by, bought out by McDonald's for zero. McDonald's, pretty smart people. Just keep that all in mind. We'll cover that more um, later. Thank you. By the way, I just got to say, I usually do workshops by myself and usually stand till five. It is so great to have a great partner in this. You have no idea. Uh, just a, a few uh, uh, fine points on, on fundamental analysis. Uh, you want to see strong annual and strong quarterly growth. Uh, the more the better. Remember when I was talking about how I only choose the very best of, of my potential picks to put on my watch list. 25% uh, annual and 25% most recent quarterly growth is the minimum. But obviously if you've got 
uh, a number of stocks that are growing at higher rates, that's what you're going to go with. As Gary says, earnings growth is, or expectation of earnings growth is the most fundamental driver of, of share price. Um, acceleration. Uh, I think everyone here knows what acceleration is, but let's just uh, review it one more time. Acceleration means an increase in the growth rate. So let's say you have, um, let's say we're, the most recent reported quarter is, is the first quarter of this year. Uh, you, uh, an acceleration in quarterly earnings might be, let's say, uh, in the most recent quarter, uh, earnings growth was up 50% uh, year over year, Q1 uh, 2001 versus Q1 2000. Uh, and then, uh, say, over, say 50%. And then the prior quarter, fourth quarter of, uh, fourth quarter, earnings growth would have been up 40%. And the quarter before that, year over year earnings growth might have been 30. So you went from 30 to 40 to 50. That's an acceleration in growth. And uh, that can be the tip off for a very powerful move in share price appreciation. Another thing that I like to see in fundamentals, as, as Gary pointed out, uh, a company can produce increased earnings growth by slashing and burning uh, on the cost side. It can shutter plants, it can lay off employees. And uh, what I want to see is, uh, so you want to see top line growth in addition to bottom line growth. Another thing that, that I learned from O'Neill's book that has always stuck with me is you, while you want top line growth, you don't want to see it outstripping bottom line growth. So let's say that earnings were up uh, in the most recent quarter, uh, say uh, 20%, but sales were up 50%. Why is this com company having to blow out product like nobody's business? and yet producing a very small uh, 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 profit increase. What could be going on there is that the company is having to drop price like crazy. Its profit margins could be crumbling. And so it's moving a lot of, it's moving a lot of pro, pro, uh, product much faster because it's been slashing and burning on price, but it's losing pricing power and it's getting less and less bang for its sales buck. So watch out for that. Um, if you get daily graphs, and I recommend that you do a free trial um, uh, uh, if you don't, uh, it's very easy to spot accelerations and decelerations in earning, earnings and the relationship between uh, quarterly growth and sales growth because at the bottom they have a thing called a fundamental quarterly block. And it's got each of those quarters lined up and you've got your earnings, you've got your, you've got your top line and bottom line percentage numbers right over each other. And so while I'm going through daily graphs, whether it's online or whether it's through the paper products, you're able to go through that right away. So you could have a, a high EPS ranking, for instance, and then you could spot these little trouble points and be on the next chart very, very quickly. Um, also, um, I do have an exception uh, when it comes to high, uh, when it comes to earnings growth. If a company has a 98 or a 99 or a 97 uh, investor's business daily relative strength or it's in those numbers for six month or 12 month relative strength on the trading market stock scanner and the chart is setting up and the price and volume action look right, the price trend is there, we'll talk about the technical analysis later, um, and, and there is a breakout, I, I may well go along that stock. Because what's going on there with, the, with relative strengths like that is the market is discounting something fairly significant in the future. And the market may be wrong. It could be one of these internet stocks that ultimately is going to get overpriced and, and fall apart. But I'm not about necessarily picking the great companies. Um, I want to be in the great companies, but what I'm really trying to pick is where the next huge rush of institutional money is going to be in these high momentum stocks so I can exploit those moves for a period of weeks to months and get out. And it's the profit growth and it's great companies normally that, that drive, that draw in those crowds. But sometimes you will see other stuff where it's not quite yet clear in the fundamentals. So, but that's the one exception to the rule. If that makes you nervous, uh, fishing in those waters and you still want to confine yourself to the best earnings growth companies, uh, uh, nobody will criticize you. That's a, still a, a very good strategy to adhere to. And that's, that tends to be the majority of my stocks as well. 
Okay, now we're going to talk about, we're going to get into technical analysis here. And if I can make this thing work here, all right. Um, volume and price. Um, the, again, uh, my belief is that Supply and demand are the most significant forces that we're going to contend with as traders. And uh, some very simple rules for interpreting uh, volume and price action. Uh, a close up, and this is uh, summarized in the article in your, in your workbook, a close up on increase in volume over the prior day represents an accumulation day, net institutional buying. Uh, the greater the volume, the more likely there's authoritative institutional buying of that stock and that that price move will continue to perpetuate in the same direction. Um, if it also closes up over the 50-day moving average of volume, that's even better. Up over prior day, up over intermediate average daily volume. Uh, an accumulation day gains greater authority the higher the stock closes in its daily range. If you have a stock that closes up over the prior close on huge volume, and it closes day's trading range is from here to here, and it's closing somewhere near the high of the range, that's another good sign. Now, if a stock closes up, but it's given up the majority of its day's gains, it's closing down at the bottom of the range, then you've got a mixed signal. Yes, it's accumulation if you're looking from close to close, but on an intraday basis, you're seeing distribution as well. And what you've got going on there is a battle between supply and demand. There are bulls and bears who are duking it out. Okay? And what you may want to do is step back and say, well, maybe it's premature to get in this. There's, there's a fight going on here. What you want to do is you want to buy where the supply is getting overwhelmed by demand. You don't want to buy where there's a fight going on between both sides. Okay? You want to step in front of that stock on the breakout when, uh, when the buyers, when, uh, when the bid is running the ask higher and higher, when demand is outstripping supply. Uh, uh, conversely, a, a close down on increase in volume is bearish as opposed to a close down on lighter volume. What we want to see is our stocks rising on strong volume and when they pull back, you know, you're going to have some days where volume will spike up, but generally speaking on the pullbacks, you want to see volume uh, quieten down, get muted. That's an indication that the seller, that the shareholders in that stock aren't getting scared, they're not running away, okay? You want, once you're in a stock, you want your fellow shareholders in that company to sit tight because their refusal to sell is what sets up the price to move higher the next time the next big block of demand hits the market. If big demand hits the market and all of a sudden shareholders are willing to sell into that, the price isn't going to move. The price is going to churn. It may even fall. You want people to sit tight saying, no, we're not interested in selling at this price. And that forces the buyers who come after you to continue bidding the price up. Now let's uh, take a look at a, at a chart here. This is a uh, daily chart. One of, the, um, one of the things that um, we like to look for, as you can see, here's, a, here's an example of a stock that was in an uptrend and then it, it peaked on March 7, 2000 and then it underwent a correction here. And one of the things that you like to look for, now you're not going to buy down here in early April, but you want to see the, f the formation, a constructive formation of a bottom. What you have here on April on 4.4 is you notice, you see that, that big price expansion. You see where the stock made, made the new low, made the low of the base, and then closed during the, the high of the day's trading range. And notice underneath, you've got this big volume spike underlying 4400, okay? Institutions are coming in and buying that stock. That's a very constructive sign. And 
uh, you'll find that in a number of good bases. You'll have a stock that corrects uh, as it hits the lows. Uh, people really get shaken out. That's another thing. It's not only that you have institutions moving into the stock, you also have the weak holders getting flushed out of the stock. Okay? People who are unhappy, they're getting chased out of the stock. Uh, the more of those weak holders you can force out earlier in the game, that's better. A weak holder is someone who has a paper loss in the stock. They're looking for an excuse to sell. You want those people to sell before you buy. Okay? You don't want them selling after you buy. You want them sitting tight on the stock. Again, forcing future buyers to bid it up in order to entice supply to market. Now, one of the things about um, institutions is they try to sneak into positions. They don't like people like us and other institutions knowing that they're accumulating position. Because what we're doing, we're buying on a breakout, is we're, we're sensing when the institutional money is jumping into a stock, and we're sort of buying in uh, in front of the leading edge of that, that, that institutional buying. And, and they don't like that because it drives up the price against them as well. And so they try to hide what they're doing. Now if you look from 3.7 to 4.4, on 4.4 you've got obvious institutional accumulation. But between 3.700 and 4.4, did you know that there also was a lot of accumulation going on? It's hard to tell on this daily chart. Um, because the, the, the stock just looks volatile, volatile and then it's rolling over. But sometimes if you look at a weekly chart, it becomes quite obvious. And here we have the same time frame expressed on a weekly chart. Now, you've got the week ending on, um, looks like I made a mistake here. There's, I have two 317s here. Look at the first 317. He had the week ending on 317. And you notice the stock closes in the upper end of its range. Okay, this is the beginning of the correction on an increase in volume over both average volume as well as the prior week. Okay, then you go forward a couple weeks. Again, you see the stock bouncing off a low on an increase in volume over the prior week. Okay, so this stock is getting in trouble, but every time it's hitting the low, some institution, a, a mutual fund family perhaps, is stepping in there and buying. And then 4.7, again, you've got the stock falling down for the week on a big volume spike and then closing up high in the range. It's down for the week in terms of price versus the prior week, but you can see how someone has taken advantage of the lows of that week to set up accumulate a position. If you're a mutual fund and you've got to buy a million or, or two million or five million shares of a company in order to make a difference to the, uh, their bottom line, you have to look for panic selling and other events so that there's enough supply coming to the market that you can accumulate a position without driving the price up against yourself. If the stock is trading lightly and, and you want a position, you jump in on that stock and you're a big institution, you're buying a million shares, two million shares, you're going to drive the price right up against yourself. So you look for these junctures, you look for these, these situations where people are, are throwing away their stock to take your position. So this is very constructive. Now you're not going to buy on the left side of this correction. You're going to wait for it to come back and show clear evidence of resuming its price advance. But if you see this, that's a flag. Keep that on your radar screen. That stock is a stock that, or if you're picking up the stock later on the right side here and you see this action on the left side, that's a sign that there's a lot of new shareholders, institutional shareholders who are looking to hold on to that stock. That's a very, very healthy characteristic. And here's America Online. Uh, again, you see the same uh, constructive action coming down the left side of the base. You see that on 731, you see how the stock is beginning to correct, but it's still closing in the upper, upper uh, uh, end of its weekly price range. And down on 731, you see uh, significant volume okay, uh, on that volume bar versus the prior week. And also, you can tell, too, versus the weeks uh, leading over to that. And then on, on 8.7, again, you see the stock, it's closing down for the week. If you're looking at that on a daily, on a daily chart, you might say, boy, this, this stock is in trouble. But on the weekly, you see, even though it's closing down for the week, it's closing in the upper end of its range, again, on another big volume spike. 
There's some institution out there who wants to buy a lot of AOL and they've been dying for this thing to start falling over so they can actually start picking up, um, picking up uh, uh, stock without driving up the price against themselves. And then again, 9-4, a, a powerful reversal day. It ends down for the week versus the prior week. Someone just looking at a week to week or even a day to day perhaps might, might think of that as a bearish sign, but that's a very bullish constructive sign. Again, you're not going to buy here, okay? But, but you're seeing a base as it's forming. This is how it ought to look. And now it's started to work its way back up on 925. You've got uh, 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 the week of 925. You've got a nice, uh, a nice price expansion on increase in volume over the prior week. We could call it an accumulation week, if you will. Uh, and then 1030, you actually have a, a nice breakout. And again, breakouts, by the way, can occur before you actually exit the entire base. We'll talk about that, such as with a cup with handle. Did that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, Gary, would you like to say some things about volume yeah, the, uh, before we get into moving averages and such? Most important thing that I do is you've got to realize big volume days are events as far as I'm concerned as a technician. And I'm always looking for what's happening during those few days around those big volume days. They are the trend changers. I'm a big believer that volume is the driving force. And that's where all stocks, I will tell you flat out, take any daily graph book, go back as many years as you want. Every big move, both up and down, started with a monstrous influx of volume, either to the downside and upside, and you have got to be watching for, the, for these moves. I love high volume reversals, because most people don't understand them and understand it changes trends. Everybody getting out at once, get me out of the way. Uh, I love the fact when a stock breaks support and then finishes above the day or the week above support. It just tells you right there, institutions have big, big hands at those levels and odds favor, that stock may set up. Conversely, on the ugly side, I love shorting stocks that are up big, finish down on the day, on monstrous volume, try to rally up and then fail and break beneath. These are the things you gotta be looking for. Photo album, familiar faces, just keep looking for these big moves. Weeklies, who, who looks at weeklies here? There are people that don't. You gotta look at weeklies. That is so important. That smooths things out over time looking at weeklies. When I see weekly, weekly five-year breakouts on weekly volume, that tells you for a few days uh, the institutions were going at it both on the buy uh, side and the sell side. Do not, every day I would be, I don't know where you get it from, I know where I get mine from, I got on Wanda Daily Graphs, uh, Investors Daily, you have got to be finding those names that are moving and I don't care whether they're breaking out or breaking down or staying in a trading range, I will go through every stock that trades double and triple or quadruple volume, look at the reasons why, look at the company, look at the sector, keeps me ahead of the game, volume is the key and any investor that does not watch volume should not be investing. I can't say that any louder or stronger. I just did, about seven months ago, I, did, and I was in front of 1,100 people in Tampa, and I asked by way of hands who looks at volume, and I can tell you but 900 or more said they do not look at volume. And then I asked them, uh, what does your broker look at, and they didn't even know. Volume is the key. It's the gas in your car. If you don't have gas in your car, it's not going anywhere. You're stuck in the mud. And I'm just telling you, just watch it every single day. That's your supply and demand. That's what we talked about, the problem in California. Uh, just remember, it's, event, it's, it's movement and it's change. You've got to look at things like uh, if there's a lot of volume and no price moving to the upside, what's the matter? If, if, if you can't go any higher after a move up. These are the little things that you're gonna learn throughout the day. If a stock is moving up, moving up, moving up, and you have the biggest volume day and it stops going up and reverses, what does that mean? These are all key indicators going forward. Conversely to the downside, it's what makes changes going forward. Volume, volume, volume. And anybody tells you differently, uh, I'm sorry, um, they got the small house out there, so just keep that in mind.
One of the reasons that weekly charts work so well for spotting uh, accumulation, just to make one final point, is um, institutions try, like I said, they try to sneak into positions and they will, they will try to scatter their orders over, over a number of days. Uh, but they can't hide. If they don't show up on a daily, they'll show up on a weekly and vice versa. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about moving averages. And um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of misconceptions about moving averages, uh, like, like moving average crossovers and um, that a break above a given moving average must be bullish. And um, uh, I, I'm of the opinion that, uh, that Dave Landry often writes about in trading markets, uh, and that is that simple moving average crossovers do not work. There may have been a time uh, before you know, we had, uh, before computer technology wasn't available uh, widely where a moving average crossover may have worked. Um, but uh, it's so easy now to generate these simple statistics. Uh, anyone who's inclined to look at, at them can. Uh, and um, uh, so you're just going to get a, a large number of false signals out of them. Moving averages, the, the two most important moving averages to an intermediate term trader are the 50-day and the 200-day. The 200-day and the 50-day are, are, are important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's what the institutions are using, particularly the 200-day. A stock that is in a healthy intermediate term price trend should have traded above its 200-day without a significant breach for at least two months. The longer, the better. Some of the best breakouts I found were trading like a, uh, above their 200-day for like 12 and 15 months. Incredible, powerful price trends. Uh, the 200-day also should be sloping upwards for that period of time. Now, you can have a stock that comes down and breaches its 200-day, but it ought to rally above it. It ought to be, uh, the breach ought to be a provocation to the institutions to get in and, um, and accumulate positions. But if it goes below that 200-day and it trades below it for a while and doesn't get above it, then I start my count all over again. The 50-day moving average is more useful in determining the more recent health of the trend and also allowing you to understand the pattern itself, the health of the pattern. The 50-day moving average should be moving above the 200-day. It's less important that the 50-day be sloping upwards, but it should be above the 200-day. Okay? Do not get into inverted situations uh, where the 50 is below the 200-day. That's a situation that indicates that there's a lot of overhead supply. A lot of recent buyers are unhappy with the purchase of their stock and they're looking to get out. What you want are the people who bought a long time ago to be happy and the people who bought more recently to be happy. So they're not looking for an excuse to sell because again, once you enter a stock, you want your fellow shareholders to hold tight because it's their refusal to, to sell at the current market price that will force future buyers to bid the share up share price up if there's ever any significant demand volume coming to market. Um, the 50-day also is used for assessing a pattern. Now, uh, how many people here have traded off cup with handle patterns? Yeah, just most people here, okay. And then there's W, w or double bottom patterns, okay, okay. Um, what you're looking for in a pattern is you're looking for a stock that's already in a strong uptrend, okay. And then it undergoes a correction, comes back up, then forms a handle, okay? And then as it pops, out of the, pops above the high of the handle, that's when you buy. The, the overall price trend should be above the 200-day as well as the, the pattern, okay? The pattern also, when it traces, should the 50-day the moving average should pass roughly through the middle of the pattern or lower in the pattern. You do not want the 50-day moving average to be up very high near the top of the pattern. Okay? And this has to do with a problem called overhead supply. If a majority of the pattern is above, or at least half the pattern is above the 50-day moving average, again, that will indicate that 
most of the shareholders should be pretty happy. They haven't had the lights scared out of them. Okay? But the higher the 50-day is in the pattern, that means the more that the recent buy, more recent that means the higher the number of recent buyers have been held underwater in that stock. And their nerves have been um, played with, and a lot of them will be looking for an excuse to get out once they reach their break-even point. And the way you calculate that, I'm not highly mathematical in, in how I do this, but a simple way to calculate where the midpoint of a stock is, is take the pre-correction high. The, the stock is going up in an up price trend, and it peaks, and the intraday high on that peak day is your pre-correction high, then it goes down and it corrects, and take the intraday low of the pattern. Add those together, divide by two, and that's what we call the midpoint or mid-level of the pattern, okay, as it goes back up. The 50-day moving average should be very close to that mid-level or below it. It can be slightly above it, but not significantly above it. Now, um, Let's see here, I believe we have some charts. Here's a good example here. Um, here you have Quest Diagnostics. And uh, this is sort of a saucer with handle or sort of a cup with handle pattern. You can see that the stock um, uh, in uh, looks like uh, late October uh, rallied significantly above both its 200 and 50-day moving averages. The 50-day is, is in red, or if you're looking at the black and white illustration in your workbook, it's just it's the, the line on the top. And obviously, it's, it's a bit more active than the 200-day. Uh, anyway, then the, sto the, st the stock resumes an upward price trend, and it gets a bit ahead of itself, and it notches a high at 32.93 here, undergoes a correction, and um, actually finds support around the 50-day. It never even really, uh, really comes back to your 200-day. Your 200-day is sloping upwards, which is healthy. And then um, it comes up here, and it starts to form a high of a handle. And then um, uh, breaks out on 126.00. Now, over on the left here, we've just done a simple calculation. We've taken the, the high of the, the pattern, 32.93. We've added it to the low, 28.87. And you've got a mid-level of 30.9, okay, or about 31. And then on 17.00, uh, the day that the uh, the 50-day sort of exits the pattern and the price gets above it. You'll notice that the 50-day moving average was at, uh, was at 30.2, okay? So right around where the mid-level was, okay? And so, uh, so this is fairly healthy. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. That's sort of what you're looking for. Uh, okay, well, in a cup with handle pattern, what you're looking for is to buy off the high of the handle. Okay? So you have this stock, it's undergone a correction, okay? And it's moving straight, uh, it's, it's moving up the right side of the, of the pattern here. And then it forms this high of this handle here, okay? And the high of the handle, I didn't put the price here, but you would buy as the stock would, would cross one-eighth of a point above that level. Preferably on strong volume, but you don't always know that when you're, when you're trading. During intraday, especially if it's the first hour of the trading session, you, know, you may not know until the end of the day whether or not it produced uh, uh, above average tr volume trading day. And by then you're already in the stock. And you'll, you'll just let your stop decide whether or not you stay in or not. On one seven. No, I wouldn't buy on one seven, and uh, here's why: it's just now breaking over its 50-day moving average. Okay, you want to be buying when 
the public or institutional excitement over that stock is becoming very, very strong. And as the stock is fighting its way up through its 50-day moving average, there's still plenty of people who don't believe it. Okay? You're looking to buy where the momentum coming into that stock is optimal. And right there, you're still running into weak holders. People are going to be inclined to sell to get out. Okay? You want it to be closer to its old high. That's correct. At about, at about yeah, it looks like that's where the, uh, where the high of the handle is, right, as it passes the high of the handle. See, uh, a concept that we, uh, that we often talk about is overhead supply or overhead resistance. The stock peaks at 32.93, all right, and, um, and then undergoes a correction. As it's working its way back up to the top, You've got a lot of people who were buying in that 30 to 32 range who are unhappy. And they're saying, boy, you know, I thought this thing was going to the moon. Uh, as soon as I'm break even, I'm getting out of this thing. And as the stock is moving up, it's going to run into waves of selling by its shareholders. People who uh, are, are, are either people who were weak holders who bought near the old high, or they were value players who managed to successfully exploit the bottom, and they consider anything around the old high to be a sell point. You want those people out of the way. And that's why these handles often form. You notice how the high of the handle represents um, uh, uh, pretty much the same area as the old high, okay? It gets up there, and you've got a lot of value players and a lot of bottom feeders who consider the stock now overpriced. They've made their little move um, off the lows here, and now they're getting out, okay? And so that's, where the, that's why the stock pulls back there. But if the pullback remains relatively tight, if you don't see it just rolling over, but you see it actually holding up very nicely, and you see the handle, see how the price is contracting, that price contraction, we'll talk about more of this um, later in the, in the um, workshop, that's a sign that the shareholders are sitting tight, that there is selling you know, by, by people who, are, who consider that high their, their sell point. But it's, it's not getting out of hand. There's plenty of other shareholders who are, who, are, who are betting that this thing is going higher, and that's what you want. Because on the breakout, when big demand comes to the stock, what do those shareholders do? They're largely sitting tight. Demand overwhelms the supply, just like here in... Uh, the California electricity market, and the stock shoots straight out. And that's, and that's why the high of the handle is your, your pivotal point. Sure. On 1.7 here, that's your first clue. That's the way I look at things when I am looking at charts of stocks. You will notice sometimes when stocks are basing, little subtle uh, changes and movements during the consolidations and in the bases. This stock, after a big move up off the lows in October towards November, has basically for the most part consolidated. Then you get that first volume influx. At that point in time, you recognize we don't have old high. We're still a couple of points away. Those people who bought it on that first little attempted, whatever you want to call it, breakout, are just happy now that they're going to get out even. They're going to provide traffic right now for the stock to get out of there. So that's where the handles come in. Goes back to near the old high, stops dead in its tracks because those where the sellers are saying, thank you, Lord, I'm out even. That's where they start going through the handle. Then you look for that next big giant move uh, to the upside. So that first move on that 1.7, I call it the clue. And sometimes in a consolidation, you see a few where maybe you have a couple of big volume up days, but it goes just right up to the high and stops dead in its tracks again and just pulls back and hangs again. I'm looking for clues always as a stock tries to get out there. At that point in time, 1.7, that is now on my watch list. It just goes to my list, and, I, and then I start watching for the handle, and then I'm looking for the next big volume influx, and hopefully it's the right way, and boom, uh, a couple of weeks later, it was out of there. The highest volume is actually the day before the breakout, and maybe that's a very narrow range day. Could that have been a clue that it was actually going to be distributed and go down? I'll say the word potentially. I'd rather have that first big volume day as the breakout, but, uh, and it and could be meaningful, maybe not. Uh, I don't know what happened there on this specific day, uh, but the next day was price and volume movement, and not just one or the other. You need both. In today's environment, do you 
buy intraday based on uh, two to three percent above recruitment, or do you buy at the uh, the next day following a close that's two to three percent above? Recruitment? I buy intraday. When that thing goes over, when that thing goes above the pivot, I'm going in there, and I'm not waiting for it to go two to three percent above the pivot. All it, it just has to be. Once it's an eighth of a point over the high of the handle, I'm in there. I'm buying. As, but, but two to three percent is my maximum above the pivot. What about the uh, intense intraday volatility that occurred now as opposed to maybe 10 years ago? Where that pivot may be you may fall back intraday or into the close back down well below. This. If it doesn't hit my stop, I'll stay in. You know, I, I'm willing to, to bear some of that volatility. So what, you buy on intraday buy stop, not on intraday no, I buy intraday. I'm there real time. When the thing goes up during the middle, during the middle of the day, whether it's the first hour of trading or the last hour of the, of the session, uh, that's when I enter. And, and you will also know if it's 11 o'clock in the morning, East Coast time, of course, uh, you'll know if there's going to be an average volume day or not. And usually when these stocks are breaking out uh, and average volume is a million and it's traded 800,000 by 11 o'clock, you know that's, that's a heavy volume day and, and you got a good shot here if the market's right, the sector's in an uptrend uh, and all these little things that we've been talking about uh, are your way. So I'm, I'm just ready to pull the trigger at any given point in time when, once it is on my watch list. Do you sell intraday as well? Pardon? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not waiting for the end of the day because I don't know what's going to happen by the end of the day. If you buy early and it turns out later in the day it really was a low volume breakout, do you get out of the stock? Do you tighten your stop? What do you do in that circumstance? If it breaks out on low volume? If you bought it early in the day because it broke out, but you didn't really know the volume for the day until the end of the day, and the end of the day turned out to be a low volume breakout, what do you do under that circumstance? There's just a higher failure rate with lower volume, so I will be on my guard. Not necessarily if it stays above the pivot point. And, uh, you got it. Less tolerance, absolutely. Yeah, I, I probably won't change my stop work. Stylistically, you're going to hear some differences in us. Uh, um, uh, but uh, I'll stay in, and I'll, I, won't be as ha I won't be as happy as if it was a nice, uh, strong volume breakout. But I'll remain in the stock. Okay, I'm watching it on a, on a real time basis. When you go to end, you know your pivot point. Go to buy uh, limit order, not buy limit buy, buy stop order at a certain price, like one eighth of a point above the 52.93. Yeah, you could, you're you talking about using a broker to execute a standing order for you? I leave it there to execute the trade if it goes above the trade. Yeah, you can do that. I prefer to execute all my trades myself. And one of the things is, is that the market makers can see on the order books, you know, where these limit orders are. And they can, they can jerk you around. They can, they can bring a stock price down to pick, pick off your, your sell stop, and they can move it up to pick off your buy and whip you around. And um, uh, so I prefer to execute all my trades myself. Now, I know that some of the direct access brokers have software-based standing orders which just sit on their system, and the market makers never see those. Uh, um, so that may be a solution to that problem if you, need to, if you need to be away from a computer and you need to just have, a, uh, have some sort of automated um, way of dealing with that. Um, also, if I have to leave my computer for you know, an hour or so, go out to lunch, meet with someone, I will put what I call a safety net, um, uh, a stop that is more forgiving than my tighter stop uh, because it's, it's far enough away that the market makers probably can't drop the stock down there just to play games and hit my order. So I may say put a 10% below um, uh, where I am. Uh, and, um, uh, and, but that's, of course, only for like an hour or two while I'm gone. You know, my, my stops tend to be quite a bit tighter than that, my initial price stops, that is. Um, Oh, absolutely. Every trade, there is a stop. Every time I buy a stock or every time I short a stock, I have immediately calculated where I will close that trade if the trade turns against me. A price above the stock if I'm shorting, a price below it if I'm buying. But you can just say that the market makers can increase the price and you are. They can. They can. And sometimes they, they'll do that. But um, 
you want to give the stock enough breathing room that that probably won't happen. And, and we'll get into setting stops later in the, in, in the session. There are ways to adjust for volatility without um, raising your risk to your portfolio. We'll, we'll be anticipating a later part of the course. Um, moving averages, let's see here. Um, Uh, this is just Quest Diagnostics again, uh, just looking at it over a longer term chart after the breakout. And notice uh, the, prior, the prior price trend. You had a stock that had a fairly stable price trend, then it got into some real trouble around October and then came back and, and restored it again. Uh, so you've got a pretty good longer term price trend, but again, it, you had to establish a minimum trading above the 200-day again in order for me to consider going back, in, going back into it. You see what I'm saying? Could you use a form? Let's see here. Okay. You'll see here you had a fairly stable price trend moving up. Then it gets in trouble, and then it rallies back above its 200 and its 50-day moving averages. Now, from this point, I want to see at least two months worth of trading, preferably longer, where the stock has traded above a rising 200-day moving average. You want, you want, the whole point of momentum trading is you are, you are exploiting the trend. You're exploiting this trend. You're exploiting this trend. You're not looking for reversal patterns where a stock is coming down to the bottom and trying to buy the bottom and, and play the move up. You're not trying to exploiting reversals for the most part. You're exploiting trends, strong price trends. And a good way to confirm the health of that trend is for the moving averages, the, particularly the 200-day, to be sloping up and the stock also be above its 50-day moving average and should be traded above that 200-day moving average for a minimum of two months, preferably longer. Now, this is an example of what William Gyler, and he wrote a book called How Charts Can Help You in the Stock Market, it's a classic, it came out in the early 1960s, uh, would call a long base with shakeout. What you have here is a stock that, uh, and we'll talk more about this particular base, I just want to illustrate the moving average here. Uh, again, you've got a stock that's trading above a rising 200-day moving average. Uh, you also have a stock where the 50-day is above the 200-day, so they're in the proper order. And this, what you have here is sort of what begins sort of like a, a long base or a flat base or a consolidation area. It's moving, it, it starts to just track sideways for a period of time in a fairly tight range. And it also is doing so on fairly low volume. These bases don't so much scare out uh, the weak holders by going through a deep U-shaped correction. They tend to grind them out, okay? But in, sometimes these will throw a shakeout toward the end here, which is, what, which is what this one did. It threw a shakeout down here and then gapped back up. Okay, so right here again, it's shaking out those last of those weak holders. Okay, and then it gaps back up and then forms a little pause here. And the breakout is when the stock actually moves into to new high ground. You can try to call this a handle, but it's not really. What you're looking for is simply for it to break above this resistance and buy as soon as you can, which it did on 11.299 and it did so on an appreciable increase in volume. Okay? Now with these, you will tend to find that the 50-day moving average will creep up above the mid-level more than your correction recovery patterns like your cup with handles. I tend to be a little less um, uh, uh, strict about the 50-day being below or around the, the mid-level. It just needs to look like it's generally going through the middle of the stock and I'll sometimes even ignore these lows for purposes of calculating the mid-level on, these, on this, long, this long base with shakeout, okay? And then there's Technotrol, how I did afterwards. Okay, uh, calculating using relative strength lines for intermediate term trades. There's an exhaustive article in your workbook that uh, I encourage you to read in your, your spare time. Um, uh, relative strength line and also relative strength scores um, uh, are a calculation of a stock's 
ability to outperform the general market. Uh, relative strength lines can be based on any index you wish. Um, I uh, uh, you know, grew up in the O'Neill uh, tradition, and so my relative strength lines are based on the S&P 500. I, I don't think you gain any particular advantage by trying to play with indexes like um, the S&P is a, is a good one. Um, but you can, if you wish, you know, build the relative strength lines based on the NASDAQ composite, or the NASDAQ 100, or the NYSE composite, or, or whatever you want to do. Um, what you want when you're screening for potential stocks, whether you're using daily graphs, or the trading market stock scanner, or uh, Telescan Pro Search database, is you want to first scan for stocks that have strong relative strength. I prefer stocks with relative strength of 90 or higher. The higher, the better. And by the way, it's not like some value players use like PE ratios. It's not like you want a, a, a 78 relative strength because then it can go to 98 or something like that. You want the highest possible relative strength stocks. And then once your tabular relative strength score, scoring screening, has allowed you to develop a list of stocks with high relative strength scores, high earnings growth, then when you're looking at the chart, what you want to see is the relative strength line also in an uptrend and nearing or making new highs on the day of, of the breakout or the day before the breakout on a six-month basis at least. If it's, if it's making new highs, you know, if, if the relative strength line is at its highest level it's ever been, even better. Is there a way to scan for that? Um, you know, I've, I've thought about that. I assume with like uh, Omega Super Charts, you could scan for that. Um, but because really what it is is a ratio. It's, it's simply the share price of the stock divided by the S&P 500, and that ratio as it rises or low uh, falls forms the, the point intercepts for the line. So I assume there'd be a way to, to scan for it. But you know, you're already scanning for tabular relative strength. And one thing is I do very, very um, limited scans. I have my high growth, I have a minimum price, I, I'm um, looking for high relative strength. And the more you build in limitations, uh, additional parameters in your scans, the fewer stocks you're going to see and you're going to miss some good setups that way. And also, by looking at the high relative strength stocks for the market, you're getting to see the bad stocks as well as the good stocks. And that helps you. That helps you understand the relative health of the market. If you go month after month after month, like we were going uh, you know, from, you know, through this bear market, and, um, and then the thing seems to be bottoming, and you're still going month after month after month after month, and not seeing among the high relative strength stocks, stocks that are forming sound bases, that tells you the market's still unhealthy. It's time to stay out. And if you followed my column in, in the months before April, you would see, I'm seeing a few breakouts, I'm going to put these out, or, or a few setups, I'm going to put these out here for you, but what are we not seeing? We're not seeing very many of these. That's telling me it's not a very healthy market, so look at these. If you want to trade a few with a very limited portion of your account, fine, but this is really just to keep your eyeballs trained in terms of what you should look for. And then in April, all of a sudden, we had a proliferation of great stocks setting up, international game technology, um, Metro One telecommunications, um, uh, and, and you know, they were just coming out of the woodwork. All of a sudden they were there. And, and uh, you will notice that shift from famine to feast if you aren't setting your parameters too high. If you're just looking for the strong growth stocks and the strong relative strength stocks and setting, say, a minimum price of, say, 10, 12 bucks, um, then you're going to look at hundreds of charts and you're going to know when the, the next bumper crop is coming in. You will see the change. And that's the thing that will give you a big edge over people who use indicators, uh, people who use, um, um, uh, you know, like the, uh, you know, macroeconomic indicators to time their decisions when to move in and out, or people who are looking at using Dow theory and looking just at the indexes. We're looking at hundreds and hundreds of high relative strength stocks, thousands in Gary's case. What do you look at? 10,000 stocks every hour? You know? it's, ve it's very sick. Uh, it's very sick. Uh, um, uh, 
we're able to see that change because we are actually looking at the market itself. We're not looking at every stock in the market, but we're looking at our market, the high relative strength market. So um, anyway, uh, going back to our, our topic at hand, you're going through the charts and you say, okay, high relative strength, high earnings growth, but relative strength line in a down slope, or relative strength line just is anywhere near its old highs, bet that one out. Uh, bat that one out, bat that out. Oh, here's one, here's a stock that has a relative strength line that's, that's sloping upward and, and it's even nudging a new high ground while the stock is making a handle. You know, that's a very healthy sign. Or it's almost there. And we'll show you some charts in a, in a minute. Um, now, a number of, of studies uh, going back to the 60s uh, have shown that during growth markets and, and, and rally markets, the high relative strength stocks do the best. Now in bear markets, they get killed. High relative strength stocks, by virtue of the fact that they've been outperforming the market and they've been in high, high price trends, have discounted a lot of future expectations into their price. Hi, Carolyn. Um, and as a result, they're like, they're like driving a Ferrari race car. Okay? You have this high relative strength stock um, and it will get you from point, a to point, from, from point A to point B faster than anything you've ever seen before. But if, if it cracks up, you've got very little time to get out of there. So money management, your stops and your position sizing, which we'll get into later, is critical in these stocks because when they break apart, they can really head south fast. Uh, again, I consider relative strength uh, even more important than fundamental performance to the point where if I have a 98, 99 relative strength stock that's setting up beautifully and the earnings aren't there, I will in many cases trade those stocks. Uh, and then relative strength again is generally measured either in a tabular or graphical form. The tabular are the percentile ratings. A stock with a relative strength of 95 has outperformed 95% of its peers in whatever database you're looking at. And um, a stock with a relative, a relative strength of I'm sorry, I said 95. Stock with relative strength of 5 has underperformed 95% of, of its peers over whatever time frame you're looking at. And then the graphical formula is the relative strength line. Usually the stock price divided by some index value like the S&P 500. Uh, don't confu confuse relative strength with relative strength index or RSI. Okay? That's, uh, I describe what RSI is in the article in your, in your, uh, in your book there. Um, it's a completely different animal. Relative strength measures the stock's price uh, against the market. RSI measures the stock's performance against itself. Uh, a, few, uh, a few notes about a tabular measurement. Uh, we get a lot of questions at trading markets saying, why is your 12-month relative strength uh, number for this stock different from the one appearing in Investor's Business Daily developed by Bill O'Neill? Well, the, the reason is, is that IBD has its own relative strength formula. Uh, and although it measures the stock's performance over 12 months, there is greater weight given to the more recent performance. And um, uh, also, their, their stock database is a slightly different universe of stocks than ours. There's, a, there's, of course, significant overlap between the two, but they're slightly different. So we have, we have slightly different relative strength measurement systems, so you're going to see different relative strength readings. The point is, is that there is no magic number that's going to guarantee that you're going to make money on a given stock. High RS scores, whether it's using IBD system or the 6 to 12 month RSs in the trading market system, are steering you in the right direction, and then it's your chart work that will tell you whether or not this stock is setting up to buy. This is now. Let's go back here for a minute. Um, 